Good morning, friends. Good morning. So glad to see you here today. Today is the second installment of our four-part stewardship series, and we'll be doing one stewardship-focused service each month. And today we're looking at stewardship, right, which is management of our neighbors. And specifically, the opportunities that God gives us to show love to our neighbors. So you'll see that in the readings, we'll hear that in the parable of the Good Samaritan in the Gospel and as the focus of the sermon this morning. The order of service is printed for you in its entirety in your service folder. You can also follow along on the screens. The hymns you can find in the blue hymnal in front of you. The hymn number is also the page number to make them easy to find. With that, let's begin our time of worship. And we join together in our first hymn, hymn 704, Let Us Ever Walk with Jesus.
Please stand. We worship in the same way we were baptized, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with gifts to serve you and our neighbor. We repent for times we have used those gifts selfishly instead of generously and selflessly. Forgive us and let your peace rule our lives. May the peace of God my Father rule my life in everything, that I may be calm to comfort sick and sorrowing. Dear Savior Jesus, you have shown us the full extent of your love by giving your life for ours on the cross. Though that love is what ought to motivate our service, too often our service is grudgingly given, motivated by guilt and obligation, instead of generously given, motivated by your love. Forgive us and let your love fill our lives. May the love of Jesus fill me as the waters fill the sea. Him exalting, self-abasing, this is victory. O Holy Spirit, you want all people to be saved by the power of the gospel. You also tell us that you use our Christian lives and service to lead them to hearing the gospel. We are sorry when people see sin in our lives and not the good deeds you desire from us. Forgive us and live within us. May his spirit live within me as I seek the lost to win, and may they forget the channel, seeing only him. As a called servant of the triune God, I announce to you his grace and forgiveness. On behalf and by the command of our Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day, by his love and power inspiring all I do or say. May the word of God dwell richly in my heart from hour to hour, so that all may see I triumph only through his power. We pray. Almighty and merciful God, you sent your Son not to be served, but to serve. Grant to us a rich measure of your mercy and strength, and work in us a love for others that overflows in acts of service and compassion. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. May I run the race before me, strong and brave to face the foe, looking only unto Jesus as I onward go. You may be seated. Our reading this morning is recorded by the Apostle Paul in his first letter to the Christians in the city of Thessalonica, beginning at verse, or in chapter 4, beginning at verse 9. Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. This is the word of the Lord. The gospel this morning, which also serves as the sermon text, is recorded by St. Luke in chapter 10, beginning at the 25th verse. Please stand as you're able. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We sing hymn 728, This is my will. You may be seated.
words of my lips and the meditations of my heart be ever pleasing in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Dear Christian friends, let's play a little word association game for a moment. I'm going to say a phrase, and I want you to just take out the first thing that pops into your head. Here's the phrase. Good neighbor. Now I'm guessing if you're like me, there might be a little ditty. <laughs> State Farm is there, right? Maybe you thought of Jake from State Farm in his red polo and his khakis. And if you believe what they would tell you, they want, to, they want you to think we will be there like a good neighbor, like that classic neighbor, if you think to the 1960s or 70s where you're grilling out, they come over, they bring a dish to pass, you know each other, the whole community gets together at the neighborhood cookout. And when you, need, uh, someone, when you need someone to pick you up at 2 a.m. in the morning from a flight or give you a tow at 3 in the afternoon because you broke down the side of the road, you've got people you can call. Good neighbors. But hopefully, by the end of today, you'll see that good neighbors are not just other people. Hopefully, you'll see the good neighbor in the mirror, the good neighbor that Christ makes you into, despite our inherent resistance and stubbornness to such a transformation. And you'll see the way that stewardship <coughs> applies to our neighborliness. See, oftentimes we can get caught up in the idea of stewardship is only about money. But it is so much more than that. Because to be a steward means to be a manager. To take in all of the varied gifts that God has placed in your, under your responsibility, within your control, and to manage them well. And money is one of those, but that's not our focus here today. Our focus is on the unbelievers, those neighbors that we have, that God has placed into our lives, those precious souls who do not yet know him, that he has given to us to be those to whom we reach out. And on top of it, the opportunities he's given us to show love, the stewardship theme, right, is a God-lived life. That means a life that is motivated by and comes from the gospel of Christ. And today's theme specifically is a life lived for others. But who are the others? Who are our neighbors? And that's where we get to the gospel. The gospel we heard today, this teacher of the law, comes, right? He sets up a question to test Jesus. He wants to see if this guy's really got it. If this young rabbi, 30 years straight out of synagogue, is like actually up to snuff. He doesn't have any formal education. He's like the son of a carpenter. I've been studying this for years, an expert in the law, right? Now Jesus, tell me, Mr. Rabbi man, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus turns the question back on him. Well, what does the law say, Mr. Expert in the law? Mr. Lawyer man, you tell me what's on the books. And he answers rightly. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Open and shut case, right? Question and answer, we've got it solved. Ah, uh, but the lawyer wasn't quite done, because that's an uncomfortable truth. That's a harsh preaching of the law, right? That's all law. I have to love my neighbor perfectly, 
I have to love him as myself? There are a lot of people out there this lawyer thinks I don't really like. Especially those enemies of Israel, the Romans who oppress us with their government, the Samaritans who intermingled with all the unbelievers while, the, while Israel was in exile, all of the various types of Gentiles around us come out. I'm a, I'm a member of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. Those people can't be my neighbor. So let me ask you this, Jesus, who precisely is my neighbor? And that's where Jesus lays out the parable. Right? Each of the three men in that parable, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, could have made up excuses. The priest and the Levite had theirs. The priest was beholden to God's law, and if that man was dead, then he would have become ceremonially unclean, and he wouldn't have been able to serve his function as a priest without undergoing a purification ritual in time. He would have missed out on his responsibilities. The Levite wasn't beholden to the same strictness of law, but he's following the priest. He's got his leader, his example, right passed by on the other side. And then there's the Samaritan. Imagine the crowd or even just the teacher of the law, the expert in the law, listening. When Jesus says Samaritan, oh, they know something bad's going to happen. They know that he's going to be up to no good. He's probably going to do something even worse than passing by on the other side. Because Samaritans and Jews hated each other. But what does Jesus say? He completely violates their expectations. He says the Samaritan, the one you would expect to be disgusted just by the sight of the robber, the man lying on the side of the road, half dead and half naked, who he knows is a Jew, rather than showing disgust, he shows love. He uses every resource at his capability, every resource at his disposal. He washes the man's wounds with oil and wine. He puts the man on his own donkey, takes him to an inn, pays with his own money, using all of the, the resources God has given him to care for this man he doesn't even know, this man who would probably hate him if they were both conscious and in the same room. And then, the knife to the heart of the matter. Jesus asks, which one of these men was a neighbor. The teacher of the law says, the one who had mercy on him. The one who showed him love. And then what's Jesus' command? Go and do likewise. That's what you must do to be saved, expert in the law, Mr. Lawyer Man. That is what you must do. You must love perfectly. You cannot withhold love from anyone. And if you seek to be saved by your own actions, then your very conscience will condemn you. Because you know by your justification you have not loved everyone. You have made excuses for those you disliked, for those who were different from you. You have hated others when you should have loved them. That's the accusation of the law to that teacher of the law, and that's the accusation of Christ's teaching to us. It's a little ironic that this section is the gospel for today because everything Jesus says here is law about what we must do. He tells us this is how you are to live. But that law, that command, gives us no ability to carry it out. 
Be perfect, as I, the Lord, your God, am perfect. A high standard, but no help for the weak sinner who hears it. Jesus teaches here that perfect love will fulfill the law. But we must conclude that we have not loved perfectly. So where does that leave us? Well, let's not forget that Jesus teaches also, and he demonstrates the love that fulfilled that law. Because in that parable, he is the Good Samaritan. And we are the half-dead, half-naked man on the side of the road. Left alone will die. Left alone, completely and utterly hopeless. And yet, Christ has mercy on us. If it were up to us, we would rail against God, fight against him at every, at every turn. Just like that man would have fought against the Samaritan if he were conscious. Because by nature we are enemies of God, but Christ comes to us in our pitiful state of death. And hatred. And he used every resource he had to rescue us. He fulfilled the law of love perfectly. He treated everyone he met as his neighbor. He sacrificed himself and shed his own blood to heal our wounds. He died so that we might live. This is how we know what love is, John writes in 1 John 3. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Matthew 20 says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He has rescued us, restored us, healed us, cleansed us. From every sin and every imperfection that exists, when the Holy Spirit comes to us with that wonderful treasure, that pearl of great price that is the forgiveness of sins and the peace, the hope, the comfort, and the joy that come along with it, he brings it to us, wins us over, changes our heart from dead to living, from blind to seeing, and creates a new person inside of us. The old us is baptized into Christ's death. That old sinful nature. And now there is a new creation inside of us that delights in God's law. Because that new creation knows the law holds no threat for us anymore. Because we are perfect. Through Christ. The law holds no danger or threat of punishment because the gospel, that good news, tells us Christ suffered it for us. And so now when we hear, love your neighbor, in view of what Christ has done for us, the new creation inside of us delights in that command. And what an awesome opportunity that the Lord has given us in an urban environment to encounter countless people day after day 
with whom we have the opportunity to show love. Love by our actions, love by our words. And it's only in view of God's mercy, in view of what Christ has done for us, that we even want to or that we can show love. So don't lose sight, my friends, that to be a good neighbor is to first fix your eyes on the cross and on the forgiveness Christ won for you. And then to act as a mirror which reflects that love into the lives of those around you. To recognize you are, you and I, are beggars invited to the king's feast, to whom he says, invite the people on the street corners and in the alleyways and in the byways. Bring them in because my kingdom is not yet full. What a, what a privilege that God gives to us. Right? To steward, to manage all of those opportunities. To leverage the gifts, social, economic, intellectual, to use the whole being that we are, that God has knit us together specially as, to leverage every one of those gifts to the glory of God the Father, proclaiming his love to the nations, to the nations that are just on our doorstep, and to the nations that are halfway around the world, the neighbors that God has placed in our lives. May he give you the strength to be that good neighbor. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guide your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join together with the Apostles' Creed, which is printed for you starting on the bottom of page 4. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We now ask our usher to bring forward our offering as we give thanks to God for this opportunity. We will join together in singing the two verses of We Give Thee, but thine own printed in your service folder. Today we do have two special prayer requests 
First of all, our member Rashida Flipson, her mother-in-law, is in the ICU suffering some uh, kidney problems. So we are going to pray for her health and recovery. We'll also pray for all of those affected by the earthquakes this past week in Turkey and Syria. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, our only Savior and Lord, we praise and thank you for humbling yourself for us. You gave your life for ours that we might be called children of God, and that is what we are. No earthly effort or riches could be given to satisfy God's just wrath over us and our sins. We were helpless and hopeless, but your holy, precious blood paid the price of our forgiveness. You gave yourself freely and willingly for us. Now eternity is ours as a gift earned by you. Grant that we live in awe of this gift and thanksgiving for each day of your grace. Grant us the grace to live our lives for you by living for others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, work in us a rich measure of wisdom that we may reflect your love for us in the lives we live here on earth. Work in us a rich measure of your peace that we can boldly spend our lives in serving others and helping them in their need. Loosen our tongues and bless us with the words to speak to encourage and help others with your love, forgiveness, and truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, creator of all, provider of our every need, strengthen our hands to serve you by serving others. Provide our every need and grant us a rich measure of your abundance that we may never fail to have enough as we share with others of the good gifts you have given to us. Help us use the hours of each day, not just for ourselves, but for you. Help us use the treasure you have given to bless others. Help us to use the abilities you have given us to serve more than be served, as your Son did for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord God, we pray for all those struggling with illness, we remember especially the mother-in-law of Rashida Flipson. Remember her pain and restore her to health. Give her the patience to bear up under these hardships with a faith that looks to you for needed strength. Almighty God, merciful Father, once again we realize that your thoughts are not our thoughts and your ways are not our ways. In your wisdom, you have permitted a disastrous earthquake to cause pain and loss. Keep the hearts of your people from despair as you sustain and comfort them. Direct all efforts to attend the injured, console the bereaved, and protect the helpless. Restore the hope of all who are afflicted and lead them to praise you for your grace and goodness. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Teach us, O Lord, to love each other more and more. Grant that as we use the gifts you give to live our lives for others, we not only glorify you, but win the respect of outsiders, that they may come to listen and learn of your life lived for us, died for us, and raised for our forgiveness and eternal life. May we make our request to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We conclude with our final hymn.
morning again, friends. Good morning. So glad to see you all here today. Glad you could join us for worship. Um, a couple of announcements I'd like to point out. First of all, in your church mailboxes, you will find this week's Lenten, or this week's, this year's Lenten brochure. Uh, if you want an extra, if you want an extra copy, we do have extras on the table in the back. Rick. Our very nice usher will be happy to hand you one, but there should be one in your mailbox. It has all of our worship information for Lent coming up, which starts with Ash Wednesday on February 22nd. Uh, we'll have services at 7 p.m. with snacks and treats to follow each service. Um, then if you look at the last few pages of your um, service folder, you can see the events of everything happening. A um, couple of deadlines. The February 15th is registration deadline for the teen time travel event being hosted in part by Amazing Love down in Frankfurt. Um, also, March 11th is going to be our youth group outing for our 7th, uh, 8th, and high schoolers. We're going to go to Medieval Times. If you're interested in that, please contact Julie Posh. She is unfortunately not going to be here today, so we will not have youth group this morning. Um, they had a bit of a family emergency that she's not able to be here for. Upcoming Lutheran Women's Missionary Society on April 22nd, that's a Saturday, at Trinity Lutheran Church in Crete, Illinois. Ellen Bavaro is our local representative for that. Uh, but if you have questions or such, Debbie Addison is here this morning. She's really involved, so you can talk to her as well. Those are always a good time for rallies. And then April 23rd, if you flip to the last printed side, you'll see information. We are having a joint um, engagement and baby shower party on April 23rd um, for Emily Flateau and her fiancé, Nate for myself and my fiance Alex, and then for the Fishers, and also the Gensteads as they are both preparing to welcome new humans into the world for the first time. What a joyous thing that will be. Um, you can see all the information there. Uh, if you have questions, you can speak to Darla, who I believe is going to talk to us about Easter flowers. Few things. Few things from Darla. Please, Darla.
One uh, final thing, maybe two final things. Um, if you haven't filled out the friendship register in your pew, please do so. You can also find a QR code if you want to use the fancy schmancy digital version. Uh, it's super easy, takes like maybe a minute. It depends on how fast you can type. Um, also, if you have not yet turned in your pledge cards, please do so. That really helps us in the budgeting process. Rick will have extras. You can put them in the wooden box on the back table. And if you haven't yet turned in a time and talents card or you lost yours or you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about, um, please pick one up from Rick. Let us know where you would be willing to serve so we can build out that database and get people with skills matched up with needs. That would be wonderful. If you have questions about either of those, you can talk to Brett Christensen, who's like the six foot seven guy in cowboy boots. Um, he's way nicer than he looks, I promise. <laughs> Uh, those are all the announcements I can think of. Anyone else out there know more than I do? No? All right. Have a blessed week. Uh, we are not because I did not get that updated, Gary. Thank you.